our newest PhD victim, Kirby Linden. Uh, I always think when I hear his name, that it sounds like a character out of a Dashiell Hammett mystery novel. <laughs> as a major detective, and he is a major detective. He works on these Martian processes, contract processes, with great eagerness and motivation. Kirby went to Houghton College, I presume, in Michigan. Yes, uh, in New York, actually. Oh, New York. And he was a mathematics major, believe it or not. Terrific. And, uh, and he went to Western Michigan for a while. He's a Michigan boy, like I am. And, uh, and then he ended up in Temple, joined the bright side of science, the planetary science, and he worked there in Martian processes also. And then came here. And although I'm the guy who signs off on his forms and gives him encouragement, he really has two best advisors are the biophysics lab, Olivier Grignon and Nathan Bridges. And uh, they've done a remarkable job. Kirby's thesis, you can see the title there. Half it's already published in EPSL, the other part is almost ready to go into production. So, no further ado, present you for viewing. Thank you very much, Bruce, for that kind introduction. Uh, my thesis is entitled Agents of Planetary Geomorphic Change, Martian uh, Aeolian Morphodynamics, and the Emplacement of Crater Ejecta. Now, very broadly, my talk is split into two parts, A and B. Uh, part A I did with Nathan Bridges, who's a staff scientist at the Applied Physics Lab, and this deals with uh, sand flux measurements and sand sheets on Mars. Part B of my dissertation, which I'll get to towards uh, in the second half, it deals with the morphodynamics of crater ejected emplacement, and I've done that research with Olivia Barnuman uh, from APL. So diving right into part A, Martian Aeolian Geomorphodynamics. Um, this is a view of the slip face of a Barkan sand dune on Mars as visited by the rover Curiosity. It's the only Barkan sand dune visited on another planet by uh, a robotic spacecraft. Now, Aeolian refers to the Greek god Aeolus, who is the god of wind. And in Aeolian, ge in Aeolian geology deals with uh, the geology of wind-blown sediment. Geomorphodynamics deals with the shape and the movement of Earth materials. Now the very first Mars uh, orbiter, Mariner 9, starting in 1970, sent back TV images of the surface of Mars. Carl Sagan and others found these enigmatic dark areas, which they technically termed dark splotches. And it wasn't until later that they were, and, and they were hypothesized to be Aeolian bed forms, sand dunes, such as here. And indeed, that's what they are. Now, Mars gets a lot of media attention for the possible presence of water near its surface and for its possibility of supporting light at some point in the past. And that's partly true, and that's warranted, but the reality is that for the last three billion years, Mars has been an Aeolian-dominated planet uh, controlled by wind-blown sand. Mars lacks significant surface water and, of course, vegetation, so Aeolian geology simply just happens differently than from the way it happens on Earth. Now, understanding the present Aeolian environment, the current moving sand dunes and ripples, um, in the present is a key to understanding the past, to borrow a famous term in geology. Uh, this view shows uh, formerly active, presumably, sand dunes and sheets, uh, now preserved as sandstone in Gale Crater on Mars, as imaged by the Mars rover Curiosity. And so by understanding current processes, we're better able to interpret uh, past processes on Mars. Now the first part of Part A comes from uh, a paper that I published as first author, along with my co-authors, including Nathan Bridges, in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters about six months ago. And it's entitled An Integrated Model for Dune Morphology and Sand Flux on Mars. Uh, there's two primary case study sites for this region. Uh, one is Herschel Crater, shown here. This is 300 kilometers in diameter. It's a uh, Milwaukee aged peak ring basin. Uh, there's three sub-case study sites within there, Western, Central, and Eastern Herschel Crater. I'll focus on Eastern and Western primarily in the first part of my talk. And then elsewhere on Mars is the Caldera Nili Patera. Now, both of these basins have sand dunes and sheets in their distal extents downwind. Pretty much the downwind third or half of these basins are covered in sand. One of the types of dunes I'll be talking a lot about throughout my talk are Barkhand sand dunes. So it's, I think it's appropriate to go over some of their anatomy. Barkhand sand dunes form on both Earth and Mars, where you have fairly unidirectional winds and therefore a fairly unidirectional sand transport direction, in this case shown by the arrows. Barkhand dunes have this uh, very uh, distinctive crescent shape. Um, sometimes people think it looks like the Star Trek logo. Um, and the wind blowing, in this case from left to right, will mobilize sand and erode sand from the upwind portion of the dune and deposit it in the downwind lee. Now, the sand in the distal part of the dune uh, becomes tr uh, sheltered by the wind from the bulk of the dune. And it forms this avalanche slip face uh, near the angle of repose. And this slip face uh, occasionally fails and it moves in a, and you get chunks of sand that slide down the slope 
and that leads to the whole sand dune moving downwind with time as one mm -hmm. as a, it appearing to be a discrete unit. Of course, Earth has uh, Barkan sand dunes as well. This is our colleague Ralph Lorenz standing near the slip face of a Barkan dune on Earth. And you can see here, here's a pile of sand that has presumably uh, avalanched down the slip face of this dune. And so this is an, uh, a mechanism by which these Barkan dunes advance downwind. Now, Mars is covered uh, with, with Barkan dunes. And, we, and I have identified many areas across the planet um, that have a similar morphological sequence beginning in the upwind and ending in the downwind regions of this. I first described it for Herschel Crater, and so I've called this uh, morphological sequence a Herschel-type Aeolian sequence. It begins in the upwind portions with discrete Barkan sand dunes sitting directly on top of the bedrock here. As we transition downwind, these slip faces become interconnected, forming Barkanoid and Seaf dunes. As we move further downwind, the geomorphology changes yet again into dome dunes, which lack slip faces. And finally, in the most distal extents downwind, we have these amorphous sand sheets that just blanket the underlying topography. So the hypothesis that we test, that I test for this first part of my dissertation, is that roughness-induced internal boundary layer, or IBL, a roughness-induced internal boundary layer reduces shear stress and sand flux downwind, partially offset by local hills, and that this correlates with local topography. So let's walk through the schematic together. As the wind blows across the bedrock, it starts to impinge upon these upwind sand dunes. These dunes then set up uh, turbulent eddies in their lee, which uh, thicken downwind into this ever-thickening internal boundary layer that progresses downwind. This thickening IBL uh, decreases the wind shear stress downwind, and therefore the capacity of the wind to move sand. And so uh, this predicts then that the overall sand flux, the movement of sand, would, de would have an overall decay, shown by this red curve, as we move further <coughs> downwind. Now this has been shown to describe the change in flux on Earth for White Sands Dune Field in New Mexico. Uh, my innovation has been to apply this to Mars and to also add this further prediction that local topography can locally compress the wind streamlines leading to increased wind shear stress and therefore sand flux. And that this overall decaying sand flux should have uh, small scale increases uh, that correlate with topography. So the methods I use are both observational, uh, where I track ripples in dunes on the surface as a way to measure the sand flux, and also numerical, where we use a numerical modeling of Mars's atmosphere. So the observational method begins with using an algorithm called COSI-CORE. It uh, stands for co-registration of optically sensed images, or the lining up of multiple images, and correlation. And this is a method that automatically tracks ripples uh, on Aeolian bedforms. Broadly, the way this works is that we take two images of the same area of Mars, in this case the western Herschel dune field, but these images are taken at different look angles. Combining these allows us to create a three-dimensional model of the ground called the digital terrain model. This is just a 3D model of the ground. Taking a third image of the same area much later in time allows us to compare changes between the, the third and the first image. And indeed, COSICOR produces uh, a ripple displacement map uh, tracking tens of thousands and probably more ripples throughout the entire sequence to allow us to measure ripple flux downwind. Now, because we've got these beautifully lined up images, these co-registered images, I'm then able to manually track the slip faces of the Barkan dunes, which COSICOR in its current incarnation is not uh, capable of doing. And in more detail, uh, I'll show you what happens here. So for a given sand dune slip face, I map the overlap of the slip face advancement, shown here in green, and then I divide by the arc length of the slip face to get a characteristic displacement of the dune, and then because I know the time, the time interval between the images, I know the speed of the dunes. Multiplying this speed, measured in meters per Earth year, by the height of the dune as measured from the digital terrain model, I can then get a volumetric flux of sand, measured in cubic meters, so imagine a box of sand, a cubic meter, uh, that travels over a meter of ground, so a cubic meter per meter per Earth year. Uh, the numerical methods I use are called, comes from a system called Mars Wharf, where in this case, Wharf stands for Weather Research and Forecasting. I have no idea how that got there. Uh, <laughs> this, this uses a 4.4 kilometer uh, grid size to, to calculate the, the wind shear stress in, in discrete areas for our case study locations. It outputs the wind shear stress every three Mars hours for one Mars year. Um, and this allows us to predict the sand flux and it also allows us to predict the fraction of the time that the sand is mobile, as blown by the wind, based on a 0.01 Pascal, plus or minus this uncertainty, uh, mobility threshold. This has been developed for Mars by Francois Ayub and others. 
and we apply it here as well. Now, I won't bore you with the details of this equation, but this, this equation is the internal boundary layer flux equation uh, that calculates the, that predicts the flux downwind. A few important components are this value I, shown here. This is the intermittency. That's the percentage of the time that the sand is mobilized by the wind. And this is uh, resulting when we uh, take a histogram of the wind shear stress as output by Mars Wharf, where the wind shear stress is plotted along the x-axis. We take the ratio of two integrals, the integral under the curve uh, from the threshold shear stress of 0.01 pascals and above, and the integral under the entire curve. So in this case, the integrals of, of, of blue plus red. And that gives us the fraction of time the sand is mobile. Uh, this other value, u, is the speed of the wind at the top of the 10 kilometer tall planetary boundary layer. Uh, this is predicted uh, using the law of the wall and the output from uh, the Mars Wharf wind simulation. And then also I'll point out that this predicts an overall power law decrease in sand flux moving downwind according to a negative 3 tenths slope. Now the innovation that I use, because this has been applied to White Sands New Mexico, uh, is to then uh, estimate the wind shear stress increase due to topography, due to hills. I borrow a term from aeronautical engineering called the panel method. In, in aeronautical engineering, the panel method is used to predict the change in wind speed as wind hits different facets of an aircraft fuselage. Well, instead of airplanes, I've got sand dunes. Um, and uh, by using this method, I'm able to calculate the change in wind speed at every point along uh, the sand dune field downwind. And I use that multiplicative factor to change uh, the predicted uh, free stream velocity u to get uh, predicted changes in flux. Now, the panel method is only sensitive to the angle of the panel, not on its physical size. So for instance, a two degree slope would correspond to a factor of 1.05 speed up uh, factor for the wind. So let's discuss some of the results here. Uh, first, uh, you know, we, we see an overall decrease in uh, sand dune height. This is a dune crest height plotted as a function of distance downwind for both East Herschel and West Herschel. And there's an overall decrease from 17 to 22 meters high on average in the upland portions to much lower 10 meters high uh, in the downwind portions. Um, now where this gets more interesting is that the flux predictions from the internal boundary layer flux equation match our data. Um, here I've plotted the three case study sites of Western, Eastern Herschel, and Nili Patera. The flux predictions from the internal boundary layer plus the slope speed up are plotted in gray, where the width of the curve corresponds to the uncertainty in the mobility threshold. You'll see that this follows an overall power law decrease as we move downwind, and then the, to the, the topography from the, the dunes and, and bedrock hills uh, locally enhance the shear stress uh, and the flux capacity. Um, the, the data from actually tracking these sand dune slip face advancements and multiplying by the height of the dune, I've plotted in these purple points here. And you'll note that they generally follow an upwind to downwind decreasing profile that's basically enveloped by, uh, by what we predict there to be. Uh, I also note that the deviations uh, from a pure power law in the data are of the same magnitude as those uh, deviations predicted by the panel method slope speed up. Um, and you know, we know for Eastern and, and Western Herschel, fluxes of 5 to 15 cubic meters per meter per year decaying to 1 to 3, uh, about 7 to 10 kilometers downwind. And Nili Patera is much more active with fluxes between 20 to 30 cubic meters per meter per year decaying uh, downwind. So the conclusions for this initial part of my uh, PhD work has been to identify this common Herschel-type Aeolian field across Mars. Uh, I've shown that the flux decreases downwind and corresponds to a change in dune morphology. I've pioneered a new method for estimating the wind intermittency from the Mars Wharf uh, 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 wind simulations. And by combining IBL theory plus slope effects from the panel method, we're able to get accurate predictions for downwind flux trends. Now where this is important and has cool broader applicability, is uh, that by using Mars Wharf and only a single image of a sand dune field, we could predict or uh, estimated fluxes through that sand field without having to get lots of uh, long temporal baseline imagery of the same area. So we should be able to apply this to areas where we've only taken one image, but where we have Mars Wharf results as well. I also want to point out that uh, you'll, you'll recall from the earlier in my talk that the sand sheets in the distal portion of the Herschel type Aeolian sequence. And this leads directly into the next part portion of my talk, which uh, is a paper that, we've, that uh, I've submitted as first author with some, Nathan and some others co-authors uh, to the journal uh, Aeolian Research. And this is titled, Eroding Dunes, Characterization and Implications for Formation of Martian Sand Sheets. So I thought I'd go into a little bit of background of what sand sheets are. Uh, when it snows, uh, the snow just kind of blankets the topography, whether you've got a hill or a valley, 
and the top of the snow just kind of forms a muted expression of the underlying bedrock. Well, sand sheets are kind of the same way. Um, they kind of just show a muted expression of the underlying bedrock topography. And here's a view on Earth from the surface of a sand sheet. Here's an orbital view of Mars of a sand sheet. You'll note that they have uh, irregular boundaries. They, have, they tend to be fairly diffuse, especially down here. They don't have any particular shape. This is in contrast to sand dunes, which uh, often have a very characteristic shape, don't mimic the underlying topography, and often have slip faces. So uh, Mars, uh, sand sheets on Mars form roughly half by area of all uh, Martian Aeolian fields. Wherever you've got sand, usually half of that by area is a sand sheet. And yet they're largely ignored in the literature. And so this raises very obvious questions of how do they contribute to sand flux and Mars' overall sediment budget, and how do they contribute to Mars' stratigraphic record? Uh, the stratigraphic record shown here uh, is a view of the Stipson Formation in Gale Crater as imaged by the rover Curiosity. This is a beautiful textbook example of sandstone cross-bedding of once mobile sand dunes and probably sand sheets as well. And so again, by understanding modern sand fluxes on dunes and sheets, we should hopefully be able to better interpret what we see in outcrop here. Again, we're dealing with Herschel-type Eolian sequences. Um, and importantly, I really want to emphasize how weird it is that these sand sheets on Mars are downwind of everything else. This is the exact opposite as it is for Earth. On Earth, most sand sheets um, are upwind or adjacent to dunes. Here's two examples from the Sahara Desert, from Egypt and Mauritania. In the upwind portions, these sand sheets uh, are upwind of the dunes, and they, and they are the sediment source for these downwind dunes. And so there's a very clear link when you have a sand dune of answering the question, where did the sand come from? Well, it came from the upwind sand sheet. This is also the case in Mauritania, where we have sand sheets upwind of these dunes here as well. So we've got a definite link between sand source and the dunes. Um, we, have a very, we have a mystery on our hands when it comes to Mars. We've, understanding the sand transport pathways is very much a mystery. This is a simulated perspective view of the West Herschel sand dune field, where we have bare bedrock, and then we have sand dunes uh, appearing seemingly out of nowhere, sitting directly on top of the bedrock, with no clear upwind sand source for these dunes. And so the hypothesis that I'm testing in this portion of my talk is that upwind dunes erode via sand suspension and source sand to downwind sheets. And I found this beautiful example of uh, sand becoming suspended off the, uh, off the crest of a dune on Earth. And so this is what I'm proposing to happen on Mars to explain dune erosion. Now there is precedence for eroding dunes in the literature, but this has never been linked to the formation and movement of sand sheets. Uh, some of the evidence comes from Endeavour Crater on Mars, which has been explored both from orbit and on the surface by the Mars rover Opportunity. Matt Chinacki and others um, observed dunes to shrink over several years, um, and to see these uh, dark sand streaks deposited on the bedrock downwind of these dunes. They didn't see any sand sheets, but they did see darkening of the bedrock by these streaks. Mary Bork and others found uh, dunes in the polar regions of Mars, at Vestitas Borealis, to completely disappear as measured completely from orbit. The measured fluxes from these areas are the same magnitude as the fluxes we measure elsewhere on Mars. So there's a very clear correlation between the fluxes we measure and the precedence for eroding dunes and even disappearing dunes elsewhere on Mars. Also, the Mars Wharf uh, wind simulations predict shear stresses high enough to suspend sand and therefore to erode dunes. Now, if I'm going to be talking about the dynamics of Aeolian bedforms, uh, it's important to keep in mind the ways in which wind and sand can move. Again, uh, I'm assuming a mobility threshold of 0.01 pascals as developed uh, for Mars by Francois Ayou. Now, on Earth, work by Nishimura and Hunt has shown that when this uh, mobility threshold is exceeded by a factor of two and a quarter, that the sand can actually become suspended and carried in the sand and not just blow along the surface. I'm not actually sure if that applies to Mars, but I start with that as a starting assumption and then I can iterate from that initial assumption. Now it's also important to understand the motions by which sand can move on the surface of a sand bed. And those three processes broadly are saltation, reptation, and creep. Now in saltation, uh, the wind will aerodynamically lift grains, uh, shown in the dotted lines here, nearly vertically off the sand bed, usually from uh, a, a vertical component of a turbulent eddy that, that catches the sand grain and moves it up. These sand grains then uh, are moved downwind and obliquely strike uh, the bed at some low angle on an impact trajectory. This impact liberates uh, a few small grain, a few grains on short hops called reptation. So we've got saltation, reptation. Both saltation and reptation, together with the wind, can contribute to creep 
which is the rolling and, and movement, traction, of sand grains on the sand bed. Together, these three processes uh, describe the total, the, the total aeolian flux of a sand dune. This is measurable by tracking the slip faces of dunes multiplied by the dune height to get a, 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 an idea of the total flux. If all we can measure, however, are ripples, that gives us an idea of just the reptation or the ripple flux. So what I'd like to be able to do is to measure the total flux on sand sheets, even though I don't have slip faces to allow me to do that. So the way I developed it, the way I proposed to do this, and the way, what I did, uh, was to get a ratio of total sand flux to, uh, to, to, to ripple flux. And the, the way I did that was by finding some bar can dunes, which are close to the sand sheets, calculating or measuring, really, the total sand flux from the uh, bar can dune slip phase, multiplying by the uh, dune height to get the total flux. And then I measured just the ripple flux using the results from Cosicor uh, from the ripples near the crest of the dune here. Then when I measure just the ripple flux here, I can multiply that by this just discovered ratio and get an estimate for the total flux uh, across the entire uh, sand sheet. So the methods I use are pretty much the same as before. I use uh, Cosicor to uh, measure ripples. I use digital terrain models to get the height of the dunes and therefore the total dune flux. And I use co-register images as well to, that allow me to track those manuals, the, the, to manually track the slip faces. Again, we're using Mars Wharf with its fairly coarse four kilometer resolution. Um, this gives us the max shear stress prediction for each of our case study sites, and also gives us the wind intermittency, that fraction of time that sand is mobilized from wind. What's important to, to recognize is that these sand dunes are only a few hundred meters long. This is well below the resolution of the Mars Wharf, um, and you know the Mars Wharf also doesn't uh, take into account the slope speed up effect for the dunes because they're below the resolution. And so what Mars Wharf does is it gives us a baseline minimum prediction for the shear stress in these areas, and we need to keep in mind that there are turbulent eddies far below the resolution here, which can locally enhance shear stress and therefore flux. So my primary case study site for doing this is in Central Herschel Crater, specifically a sand sheet highlighted in blue here. Uh, I've blown it up here. You can see that this, so this does follow a Herschel type Aeolian sequence, except that it only shows the end members. We start in the upwind portions with the discrete bark can dunes sitting directly on top of the bedrock, they transition immediately, skipping everything in between, to these airily extensive sand sheets downwind. The sand sheet is fairly thin. It's less than five meters thick in many areas. This is a, a digital terrain model where uh, reds are high, purples are low, uh, and it's superimposed on top of an image of the area. So it is quite thin, less than five meters thick, with uh, gentle slopes on the bedrock margins of uh, only um, one to four degrees, compared to roughly four to eight degrees for the upwind slopes of Barkhand dunes. There's, there's four main geomorphic landforms in Central Herschel Crater that uh, I described. Uh, they're this smooth unit I'll describe more in a minute. Of course, we have sand dunes. Uh, we have this rough intracrater unit, which uh, are, is composed of uh, lots of uh, heavily degraded small impact craters. And of course, we have sand sheets. I'll be focusing primarily on the smooth unit and on sand sheets. Now, the smooth unit is something that I've interpreted to be lithified paleo sand sheets that are no longer active. The evidence for this is that they embay higher topography, uh, I've outlined these in blue, they, they embay higher topography, they form in a, at least the modern day downwind lee of bedrock topography, consistent with sand, sand sheet formation. They're darker than the surroundings, consistent uh, by being formed from darker basaltic sand. And I also note that they, they lack ripples, um, which could be explained if any lithified ripples have been uh, sand blasted and planed off from saltating sand. They're lightly cratered, indicating that they're uh, younger than the surrounding rough intercrater unit, and then sometimes they can be superposed uh, by new uh, sand sheets highlighted in orange here. Now these sand sheets are of course superimposed by, uh, by, by ripples with a wavelength or distance between their crests of about three meters, uh, and I've shown that here on this uh, histogram of bed form sizes. This is taken from a wonderful paper by Matthew Lapotra and others. These are in the same population of ripples as measured on the ground because I can only measure ripples from orbit. These are in the same population uh, of ripples measured on the ground from the rover Curiosity and Gale Crater. And importantly, I can use the Gale Crater uh, measurements of ripple height to give me an estimate of ripple height for, for uh, Central Herschel Crater. Uh, just very briefly, the average ripple speed on the sand sheet uh, follows this distribution with about a one, speed of one and a quarter meters per Earth year. This corresponds to about a fifth of a cubic meter per meter per Earth year, and the direction is uh, to the south-southwest, which is consistent with the overall uh, bed form orientation. 
Now measuring the ripple fluxes on the crests of dunes shown in the maroon bars for West Central, East Herschel, and Nili Patera shows that ripple fluxes near the crest of dunes are a few hundreds to a few tenths of cubic meters per meter per year. The gold bars show the ripple fluxes for sand sheets in the same area, uh, you know, with, with, rough, with a few hundreds to a few tenths uh, of cubic meters per meter per year. Uh, Nili Patera is quite a bit more active on its dunes, and uh, there currently isn't uh, enough data to measure the ripples for Nili Patera. So those are the, just the ripple fluxes. But I can ratio that to the total flux measured from Barkhand's slip face advancement. And I can come up with this ratio of total flux to ripple flux for the four case study areas. They, they have a broad range from 5 at Nili Patera up to 91 for East Herschel Crater. Um, and so very clearly, you can't, there isn't one ratio that you can use across Mars. But nevertheless, oh, and so what this underscores is the importance if you've got a sand sheet you want to measure the total flux on, you better have a local bark hand sand dune handy to get the ratio for that one region. When, that, when I multiply that ratio by the ripple flux on the sand sheets, again plotted in gold here, we see that we get total fluxes relative to dunes that are very comparable. In fact, for all intents and purposes, we've got the same fluxes on sand sheets as measured uh, on sand dunes by the slip faces, again shown in maroon. That came as a quite a big, big surprise that uh, both sheets and dunes seem to have the same flux activity. Uh, from integrating the histograms of wind shear stress output by Mars Wharf, we see that we have varying but roughly comparable wind intermittency values for our four case study sites. I tossed White Sands, New Mexico up here. This was measured in situ by a weather station. Uh, and for, so, uh, you know, to give you a mental baseline, uh, sand is mobile about 3% of the time for White Sands, New Mexico dune field. Uh, and, you know, that's roughly comparable to some of the other case study areas through here. <laughs> now, the Mars Wharf predicts sand suspension, assuming that the threshold for suspension is two and a quarter times the mobility threshold, or in this case, that would mean about 0.019 pascals. The Mars Wharf predicts shear stresses for all four case study sites that are at or slightly above those values. Now, even if this assumption is incorrect for Mars, given Mars's different atmospheric characteristics, other lines of reasoning developed by my co-advisor Nathan Bridges uh, considers the terminal fall velocity of a sand grain in an atmosphere combined with its threshold friction speed uh, and predicts that sand can be suspended uh, between about 0.05 and 0.06 pascals. It's not that much, it's not that far above what we predict from Mars work and considering that the turbulent eddies uh, certainly produce shear stresses locally uh, above the baseline of Mars work, it's not unreasonable to suspect uh, that that mechanism could erode uh, dunes as well. So the conceptual model I've developed for what I think is going on for these dune fields uh, is that we have an, uh, wind coming along upwind uh, bedrock, beginning to impinge upon the dunes, which in turn set up this turbulent internal boundary layer with decreasing shear flux downwind. Now as the wind impinges upon the upwind dunes, it, uh, the wind initially has enough strength to bring the sand into suspension, <coughs> carry the suspended sand downwind, and deposit it into these sand sheets. What can then happen? is that the uh, sand sheet can become indurated, that is lithified, turned into sandstone uh, over time. The ripples can become planed off, leaving what we observe to be the smooth deposit. This is in stark contrast to the situation for Earth, in which we have upwind sand sheets, which typically accumulate due to vegetation and water trapping sand, and partially sourcing sand to downwind dunes, which can vertically accumulate on the sand sheet and on each other, but then as the internal boundary layer thickens downwind and the shear stress decreases downwind on Earth, vegetation again can take hold, immobilize dunes, and other processes can overwhelm Aeolian geology, such as vegetation, water, or bedrock in the distal extents, and terminate the Aeolian sequence. Now this leads me to uh, propose a, a model taking into account climate change on Mars. Now many in this audience will be familiar of the dramatic climate changes that Mars undergoes from uh, from obliquity cycles. That is, Mars's spin axis is not stable over 100,000 to million year time scales. It varies quite a bit. At high obliquity, the north and south pole can alternately point toward and away, almost right toward and away from the sun. And at low obliquities, it, the axis is 90 degrees to the orbital plane, about basically straight up and down, shown here. This leads to dramatic variations in, uh, in the wind environment. I've shown this change in, uh, in obliquity by this uh, maroon uh, sine curve here. And I've uh, corresponded it to uh, uh, several processes, and I've shown the relative importance of each process by the thickness of the colored blob. Uh, 
And so by atmospheric modeling work by Haverly and others, they predict that at very high obliquities, uh, there should be very high wind, shear, wind and shear stresses as well. Now right now, Mars is in a kind of a period of moderate obliquity, around 24 and a half degrees, very similar to Earth. So we're in moderate wind shear stresses. We seem to be at this tail end of dune formation that allows for erosion of dunes to start, to start forming sand sheets. Uh, I suspect that this may continue as the obliquity increases and wind shear stress increases, but only to a point. Uh, mapping by Jim Head and others has shown that at very high obliquities, so you can have low latitude ice near the equator that can immobilize uh, sand sheets and sand dunes and allow for diagenesis, the formation of sandstone from mobile sand, to dominate at very high obliquities dominated by ice. Then as the obliquity drops again, the wind shear stress drops, we get back in, perhaps into the current regime we have now, but at very low obliquities, uh, the wind shear stress dies off and may completely disappear. There's some modeling work that suggests that Mars' atmosphere may collapse completely onto the surface, leaving Mars in a vacuum. Um, and this would allow for a settling of dust, which will infiltrate between sand grains and further enhance diagenesis, the formation of uh, sandstone. And so what I propose is that uh, diagenesis may dominate <coughs> in high and low obliquities, but not so much in this middle regime where we are currently. Now this in turn further predicts a hypothetical model that dunes and sheets may be a self-sourcing system. In other words, that in the current Mars, dunes are sourcing the sand for sand sheets, and that over, as time goes by, these dunes will kind of erode down to their nubbins, forming upwind sand sheets uh, into this situation here. This may have been the case in the past, and maybe the situation again, and could be the source for downwind dunes. Meanwhile, this whole system of sheets and dunes would migrate downwind and mass, uh, likely because it's been cut off from an upwind sand source. So this, basic, this could very much solve the problem of the sand source for Martian Aeolian fields. Uh, that's, what my, that's a major contribution I feel of my PhD, uh, but I think there's a future work to be done beyond the scope of my PhD in this. So my contributions at this point uh, are to identify a bed form arrangement that is consistent with dune erosion. Again, I haven't proven it, but I've shown consistency with that. I've shown that ripple migration on sand sheets implies above saltation threshold winds, and this is further supported by wind modeling from Mars Wharf. Uh, I've seen a, I measured a total to ripple flux ratio, uh, which is a new method that allows for estimation of total flux on sand sheets, and this sh sh shows the sheets to be just as active as dunes. I've interpreted the smooth unit outcrops as paleo sand sheets, consistent with climate change uh, controlled aeolian regimes. And if indeed the sheets are forming from upwind dunes, it suggests a time when the reverse may have been true. And I finally propose that modern self-sourcing of Aeolian fields can largely explain the apparent lack of sand transport pathways. Now that first part of my PhD dealt with uh, granular systems on Mars, blowing of sand. The next part of my PhD that I've done with Olivier Barnouin uh, deals with something completely different, <laughs> except for the case that it still deals with granular systems. And that is the emplacement of crater ejecta. My background image here is the surface of the heavily cratered surface of Pluto's moon Charon, which is a planet in its own right. And this part is entitled Preliminary Laboratory Investigations of Eject and Placement Morphodynamics with Planetary Applications. Now the most ubiquitous surface geologic process in the solar system is that of impact cratering. All the solid worlds either get hit or they hit something else. Um, when uh, a planet such as Mars or the moon gets hit, a crater can become excavated. The material that got excavated gets ejected, and it's called ejecta, and it forms these circumferential deposits around the crater. So here's a view of uh, Concepcion Crater on the surface of Mars. You can see these beautiful strewn boulders that are ejected from the crater. Um, even small, irregularly shaped worlds like Pluto's moon Nix may have ejected deposits around this large crater. Of course, Pluto uh, has ejected deposits seen here. This is a very common process. And the motivation for understanding the emplacement of ejecta is to be able to constrain the transport histories of, uh, of rocks, uh, of parcels of regolith, for petrologic analysis, remote sensing, and stratigraphic interpretation. Uh, and uh, I think a good example of this uh, is this famous sample from Apollo 15 on the moon. This is a chunk of a northosite, basically in a sea of basalt. You've got a chunk of a northosite, very different lithology from its surrounding lithology. So very likely this got in place as a piece of ejecta. So understanding ejecta emplacement would help petrologic uh, analysis of this sample. 
Also, in remote sensing spectroscopic studies of the moon, uh, we see transitions in different uh, uh, geochemical facies. This is Mari Serenitatis, and we see a change in geochemical facies in, with implications for stratigraphy as we transition south into uh, Mari Tranquilitatis. So we'd like to be able to understand transport histories from ejected emplacement using experiments. Now, most experiments dealing with cratering uh, focus on forming a focus on hypervelocity project projectiles forming impact craters in a laboratory. Uh, what you just saw was a movie of a projectile probably traveling around six kilometers per second at the NASA Ames vertical gun range into a pile of sand, um, forming a roughly 30 centimeter diameter crater. The ejecta you see here as this inverted cone of material with an angle of about 45 degrees to the surface sweeping and depositing itself along the planetary landscape. Now rather than forming craters, I focus on the portion of ejecta here, this outward sweeping wall of debris. Now most prior work assumes that ejecta becomes in place uh, in, a very, in a fairly predictable power law decrease, that, as the, that you thin the ejecta deposit according to a power law of the slope of negative three as you move away from the crater. This is based on some famous work by McGetchen and others, 1973. Um, I'm proposing that this is probably too simplistic a model. Um, other workers uh, treat the problem as though you, you eject eject from the crater, it follows a ballistic arc, which is correct. It lands and then it stays put where it lands. Uh, this is, again, overly simplistic. This assumes that the ejecta does not flow. We know ejecta flows based on field geological mapping of craters on Earth, in this case the Ries Crater in Germany, where the ejecta deposit here, the Bunta Breccia, uh, overlies this high, heavily striated, you can see the linear striations here, on this underlying unit, and the units below there show evidence of lateral shear away from the crater and these uh, lateral displacement faults throughout here. Um, and so we, we propose the same thing happens. Now, I borrow a lot of the theory for uh, ejected emplacement studies from the field of impact cratering studies. Uh, what typically, the, the way impact craters are typically characterized um, are by calculating this cratering efficiency term here, m over m, where uh, large m is the amount of eroded mass, that's the stuff that got kicked out of the crater, and ratioing that to the amount of emplaced mass from the impactor, m over m. Um, I'm using that in erosive efficiency. This is typically plotted on the y-axis as a function of another variable along the x-axis in log, log space. m over m is plotted as a function of this dimensionless value pi 2 shown here. Now, those of you familiar with fluid mechanics will recognize this as the inverse of the Froude number. And so what we're doing is we're ratioing the gravity of the planet to the physical size of the impactor, r, divided by the square of the velocity. Uh, and when this is done for hypervelocity impact experiments, they tend to fall along uh, power laws, straight line power laws here. Now because I'm dealing with much slower ejecta uh, than these impact experiments, and that it's physically larger, uh, I'm expecting my results to plot somewhere down in here at high pi 2 values, and probably relatively low cratering efficiency or erosive efficiency values. Other theory I borrow is from the field of landslide geology, which uh, looks at this uh, value called runout efficiency. It's just how easily a landslide falls off the hill and, and, and runs out. Uh, this is simply uh, a balance between the work done by the landslide to the initial energy that it had to do that work. In the case of a landslide, uh, the maximum energy that it ever had was the gravitational potential energy it had when it was up here on the hill. The work that it did uh, is the work that it did on the landscape as it flowed out, unfortunately here in a populated area. Um, uh, in the case of uh, an ejecta curtain, uh, this work energy balance is the work done by the ejecta as it flows out over the surface compared to the maximum, not potential energy, but kinetic energy that it has right before landing. Now the runout efficiency for landslides, uh, these are data for both Earth and Mars, are typically plotted on a log-log plot, where runout efficiency is plotted as a function of the volume, in this case cubic kilometers. You'll see that it tends to follow roughly a power law, but that at, at smaller volumes it kind of levels out down here. Uh, and so um, I'll be comparing my uh, ejector runout experiments to what has been measured uh, in the field on both Earth and Mars for landslides. Um, another important parameter to keep in mind is the amount, is the fractional amount of kinetic energy of the ejecta available to do work after it hits. So the ejecta curtain has its maximum kinetic energy just before impact, and this value E is a ratio of the kinetic energy that it has right as it begins to slide to the kinetic energy it had right before impact. 
And that will be a fraction of the total kinetic energy available for work and run out. The way I do this is by simulating a wedge of ejected curtain without having to simulate the crater in the first place. The main advantage to this is that A, I don't have to make a freakishly huge crater to be able to do this, and B, it gives me much larger volumes of material compared to the small volumes of ejecta made in hypervelocity uh, experimental craters in the lab. Um, this is the first time this has ever been done, to my knowledge. Uh, and so uh, the way we do this is by using the world's only ejected catapult, <laughs> which assumes that an imaginary crater formed back here, and that we're just simulating a wedge of that ejected coming out. This is basically a human-sized mouse trap that gets winched back. We load it with gravel in between these plates here, and then we let it fling. And it looks like this. Now, uh, this is just fun. Uh, that, that's high speed, and then it goes immediately into slow speed, because it sounds cool. Uh, but you can see that the ejecta has quite a bit of mobility after it lands. Here's the ejecta curtain landing, and here's how much runout is, is occurring. So you see this is a highly dynamic process. And so there's really two research goals in this. One, since this is a brand new method, is to establish that the catapult accurately simulates a portion of ejecta curtain, or not just mindlessly flinging gravel. <laughs> And the second objective, if we can establish this, is then to uh, understand the geologic consequences of ejecta emplacement. Now part one involves matching the measured curtain velocities and mass profiles that we measure in the lab to what is predicted from theory for naturally occurring craters. If we can do that, then we can start looking at the consequential geology with confidence that it's simulating something that actually occurs in nature. And so the things we'll be looking at are this erosive efficiency, that's M over M, We'll be looking at the pi 2 scaling that you saw plotted before. And we'll also be looking at the runout length and the runout efficiency to compare these to landslides. Again, that runout length is the distance that the ejecta flows from where.